Good morning, Hope Church. How are we doing? Good. Good to hear. My name is Drew Williams. If we have not met yet, I'm part of the uh, preaching team here, and uh, I get to break in this cool new stage. Got a lot of real estate up here. Plenty of room for activities. The title of today's message is called, It's in the Bag. For you note takers, it's in the bag. And we're going to take a look, open your Bibles to John 20, John chapter 20. And so we've been talking uh, about the Beatitudes the last several weeks. How many have appreciated Pastor Josh's journey through the Beatitudes? It's been good. And this concept of what is Jesus called blessed? In the kingdom of God, there are things that we call blessed that maybe we don't call blessed in the kingdom of America or the kingdom of Missouri, as it were. Where the world would say to be blessed, to be happy, to be fortunate, to have people look at you and say, you lucky bum. That's a Joshism. It's This word blessed means they're happy. People look at you from a difference and they want what you have. You're in an enviable state. That's what the word means. And our world would continue to say that in order to be happy, you've got to acquire more, bigger house, nicer car, better vacations, uh, you know, bigger bank accounts, more land, whatever the thing is. The world would say to be blessed, you've got to run down that path of acquisition and achievement over and over again. But the message of the Beatitudes and the message of the kingdom is that to be blessed, it looks a lot different. Jesus says you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. The blessed person is the meek one. The blessed person is the one who mourns. The blessed person is the one who hungers and thirsts after righteousness. And so we're going to look at another thing that Jesus calls blessed here in John chapter 20. We're going to jump out of the Beatitudes, but the same vein of what does Jesus call blessed. We're going to look at Thomas, the disciple, this interaction he has. And Thomas gets a bad rap because when you think of Thomas, there's one word that he gets described as a lot. Which word is that? Doubting Thomas. Wah, wah. Poor guy messed up one time in all of eternity. He's like, Thomas? Oh, yeah, he's the doubter. You ever wonder what the one word description of you is when you're not in the room? <laughs> Who's that guy? I can't remember his name. You know, the kind of guy who kind of walks like a bird. You know, that guy? <laughs> hey, he's got those uh, the eyes where he looks at you. It looks kind of. Sometimes people go, oh, he's the kind one, he's the generous, he's the one who's always in a good mood. Or it might be, oh, he's that one who's always kind of negative. He's the guy who just walks in late to church. Oh, yeah, that guy, you know? How do people describe you when you're not in the room? Thomas gets a bad rap because all of a sudden, all eternity is calling him Doubting Thomas. And we're going to take a look at how he got that and just this story of Doubting Thomas. Let's take a look at John chapter 20. So this is after the resurrection. After the resurrection, it says, where am I at? Let's go uh, verse 19. It says, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, so note, Jesus just shows up in the room. It's like doors are locked and all of a sudden he's here. And he says, peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed the disciples his hands and his side his hands that had been pierced, his side that had been pierced. And the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them, peace be with you. Let's jump down to verse 24. Now Thomas, one of the 12, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas said back to them, unless I see his hands and the mark of the nails, and I place my finger into the mark of the nails, and I get to place my hands on his side, I will never believe. Note that Thomas had been with Jesus this whole time. He'd been with him for three years in the journey. He'd seen the miracles. He'd seen the feeding of the 5,000. He'd seen the people healed. He'd seen the power that Jesus walked in. He'd been sent out to work miracles in Jesus' name. He had seen all of that and experienced all of that, but he gets to this point and says, that's great other 11 guys that were there when I wasn't, but until I experience what you experience, I'm not going to believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, verse 26, and Thomas was with them. So same scene, they're all in a room, and all the doors were locked again. Jesus, whoop, came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. 
Then Jesus said to Thomas, Thomas, come here. Put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord, my God. And although Peter had said, I believe you're Christ, the son of the living God, this is the first time in the gospel someone said, my Lord, my God, to Jesus. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? And here it is. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have still believed. Let's pray. Father, as we open your word and we look at this story, God, this, your word is alive, it's active, sharper than a two-edged sword. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. God, as we open your word, may it come alive to us. As we read this story about what you said to Thomas, God, let us find ourselves in the story. God, let us take our doubts to you this morning. God, and I pray that you would seal it in our heart, God, that, that sometimes you answer the prayer in a profound way, and sometimes you let us touch the hands. But Lord, you said to Thomas, and you're saying to us today, you want to be happy? Believe without having to see it. I pray that you would sink that message in our heart this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Several years ago, me and my buddy Vince were driving. Vince had a Jeep Wrangler, summertime, tops off, driving around, beautiful day. And we're going to pick up some, uh, some Chick-fil-A. I know this is cruel because you all know they're not open after church today to go get your own. God bless them. I heard it called the, the Protestant poultry today. It's the Lord's chicken. So we're going to get some Chick-fil-A, as you often do. It's delicious, those waffle fries with just the perfect amount of seasoned salt. We're going to get some Chick-fil-A, and as we're driving down, there's a, a homeless guy on the corner. Standing there, cardboard sign, hungry, please feed me that thing. And I, uh, I'm not going to lie to you guys. I'm often in the camp of act like I don't see him, don't make eye contact, slowly lock the door, don't get too holy on me. Family center, don't get too holy. But in that moment, I just felt something prick my heart. Like, hey, you're going to Chick-fil-A. This guy wants some of the Lord's chicken as well. You can handle this one. And so I felt just compelled in that moment. The way it was set up, I was riding shotgun. Vince was driving. He was on this side on the way to Chick-fil-A. So on the other way back, I was going to be right there in the Jeep Wrangler with no door, no window, no nothing. And it was going to be an easy pass of the bag of goodness, a provision to homeless guy. So I'm like, all right, Lord, I'm doing it. Go through the drive through and I'll be like, I'll have three number one combos. One for me, one for Vince, one for said homeless guy. Go through the drive through and I'm feeling really good. I'm feeling like, okay, I'm doing it. Really doing it, Lord. Taking care of the least of these. So we pull up, the stoplight's coming up, and I've got it kind of positioned. I'm ready. I pulled my stuff out of the bag. I've got the bag with his combo meal in it, his icy cold Chick-fil-A lemonade. It's delicious. And I feel really great. And we pull up to the light, and we stop, and I lean out of the Jeep. Excuse me, sir. Are you hungry? He gets up and comes over, and I'm feeling really great. I'm expecting him to, to grab the food, to say thank you. I'm like, I don't know. Am I going to do the the bro hug out the Jeep thing or not, or is it fist bump? What, what is the standard issue interactions gonna happen here? So I'm expecting to have this moment where I'm providing for him. And this guy comes up to me, he snatches the cup out of my hand, he snatches the bag out of my hand, looks me in the eyeballs and says, where's the straw? <laughs> I was shook, it's not what I expected. The light turns green. I said, it's in the bag, man. Off we went. <laughs> I find myself in the story of Thomas fo focusing my eyes on the one thing that I can't see that Jesus hasn't done yet. And I find myself snatching the bag of God's provision in my life. And he's given me everything that I've needed. So far, so good. And my mind and my heart spin around in anxious circles, causing me to become doubting Drew, asking God, where's the straw? It's in the bag. What's the thing that you can't see right now? 
What's the unanswered prayer in your life? What's the thing that, that if you thought about it, this is my mind is generally focused on this one thing between me and God. If I'm honest, it's on the one thing that he still hasn't done and that I haven't seen. Has God been good to you? Think about it. Has he, has he provided? But where's your focus? For me, it's often on the thing that I can't see and that I don't know. This morning, I just felt compelled to tell you, it's in the bag. Where's your past? Where's your forgiveness? It's in the bag. He's handed it to you. He said you're free. He's freed you from shame. He's issued forgiveness. But some of you are so wrapped up in your mind trying to work out your forgiveness with God when he's handed it to you and you're saying, but where's my forgiveness, God? It's in the bag. Some of you are so spun up and caught up in your future wondering, how is this going to work out? How am, I, am I always going to be single? Am I always going to be sick? Am I always not going to know the answer? Am I always going to have this situation going on in the, my family? And the Lord would come to you today and say, it's in the bag. Just because you can't see it right now doesn't mean that the reality of God's provision is not making a way for you in your future today. And God would tell you today, grab the bag and understand everything you need for life and godliness and provision is handed to you in the person of Jesus. The straw of your life is in the bag. You're not forgotten. You're not an afterthought. God didn't forget about you. And Jesus came to Thomas, and he'd come to you today and say, hey, you're not going to see everything. And he showed Thomas his hands, but then he gives him this message and says, yes, I'll show you my hands. But you want to be happy? You want to have peace that we sang about? Do you want to have joy and chaos that makes no sense that we just sang about? You can have that. Blessing is in the person who believes without having to see it. If my belief only goes as far as I can see, I'll end up being crippled by fear. And I'll be a very unhappy, unpeaceful, unjoyful Christian. Because I've refused to take on the blessing of following God beyond what I can understand. And ultimately what happens is if I can only follow God as far as I can see him, then I'm ultimately reducing God down to my capabilities, my explanations, the way I'd do it if I were him. And who's ultimately Lord of your life in that situation? You are. That's why I only get invited so often, you know. <laughs> I got five points and then three questions at the end. Point number one. I have doubts, and so do you. I don't, I don't have all the answers. We were in our Hope family group this week, and we were talking about Romans 9 and this conversation of, like, Pharaoh and, like, did God destine him for this and that? And it's like, at the end of the day, like, I don't know. I don't get it. I can't explain it. I have doubts, and so do you. I ask God often, hey, man, where's the straw? But God doesn't answer all of my questions. And he's often calling you to a walk of faith. And he's not calling you to a walk of philosophy or intellectual understanding. He's calling you to a walk of faith. But often we reduce it down. And men, probably more so than women, we reduce it down to intellectual understanding of cause and effect. And two plus two always has to equal four. And sometimes God is telling you two plus two equals a purple giraffe. And you're like, what? Walk with me. Let's go check it out. I don't always see the straw in my relationship with the Lord, and sometimes I worry that he forgot it. I worry he forgot my future. I worry that he forgot the dream that I had in my heart. I worry for, he forgot the promise that I'm sure he made when I was 19 years old that I still haven't seen yet. I think he forgot that he's a healer, and I see other people getting healed, but he hasn't healed me. And I think God forgot the straw in my life. The straw is in 
the bag. God has not forgotten about you. He's still a healer. I think we're worse about this in the state of Missouri. It's one of the reasons I love this place. But Missouri is called the what state? Show me state. There's a natural skepticism in the air. I don't know if it's in the water. But the, widely, the most widely known legend about where that phrase came from came from Missouri's U.S. Congressman William Duncan Van Diver, who served in the United States House of Representatives from 1897 to 1903. And while a member of the U.S. Committee on Naval Affairs, Van Diver attended an 1899 naval banquet in Philadelphia. In a speech there, he declared, I come from a state that raises corn and cotton and cockleburs and Democrats, and frothy eloquence neither convinces nor satisfies me. I am from Missouri. You have got to show me. And skepticism will serve you well in a lot of ways in life. Having to see it to believe it in a lot of ways when it comes to your, you know, just things in life. It's like, I'm not impressed with what you say. Show me what you do. Like, you're not going to sell me. Like, don't get sold by a car salesman or a politician. It's like, no, I'll believe it when I see it. And that's a uniquely American thing. It's probably an even deeper Missouri thing, and I like it. But when we get into a show-me state of mind towards the things of God, you will miss out on the blessing that he has for your life, the blessing of peace and joy and comfort and happiness in the middle of the thing that you don't understand. And if you'll only follow God to the point that you can understand him, you are missing out on the kingdom life that God actually has for you. The kingdom of God, you are blessed if you'll follow beyond what you understand. It's interesting, John writes this in John chapter, in that verse 30, he keeps going. So John wrote this in AD 90 to 100. At this point, Thomas had already been martyred. He was martyred in 72 after he went to India. Uh, But so, so Thomas is martyred. John's now writing the book of John. And it says, he tells this Thomas story. And he says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But John's saying, but I'm writing these down so that you, in Hope Church in 2024, may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that, by le- and, ba- and that by believing, you may have life in his name. John's saying, you're not going to touch Jesus' hands in 2024. You're not going to physically touch his side like me and Thomas got to do. But I'm writing these things down so that you could have the blessing of choosing to believe that Jesus was resurrected even though you never got to touch his hands like Thomas did. He's writing it to you and to me. I have doubts and so do you. I am doubting Drew. And I am the homeless guy saying, hey God, what's up with this? Where's it at? I don't see it. Number two, experience can give you certainty but belief brings blessing. Thomas got, gets a bad rap because he only actually asked for what everyone else had seen. The 11 disciples had already seen it. It says Jesus came to them and proactively shows them his hands and his side. And then when Thomas just asked to see what everyone else had experienced, all of a sudden now he's the doubting guy. Jesus gives Thomas that certainty. And certainty from God sometimes can ease your troubled mind when God just answers the prayer. But when God answers all of your prayers and satisfies all of your mind, oftentimes your heart for him can grow cold. And the mystery of following the Lord is often exploring the unknown and the things that you don't understand side by side and letting him reveal that to you over years of walking with the Lord. But it requires a heart that says, I don't need to understand to continue to walk with you. The blessing is this. You'll rest easier if you can trust me with the unknowns. You want to sleep at night again? Got the blessing you want? Some of you didn't sleep last night because your mind was spun up on the past or the future. And Jesus is saying, you want a blessing? You want to sleep at night again? The straw's in the bag. Trust me. You guys picking up what I'm putting down? Can you sit in your brokenness and still believe that God loves you? Can you sit in singleness and still believe his word that he sets the lonely in families? Can you sit in sickness and still believe that God is a healer? Thomas only wanted what he knew other people had experienced. Another way to look at this thing, the seen and the unseen. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. This is Paul writing. He says, so we do not lose heart. Have you lost heart? We don't lose heart. 
Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self, our truster, our believer, our faither, is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction, Paul's shipwrecked, beaten up, thrown in prison. He has physical afflictions that God never healed, this side of the grave. But he puts it in perspective and says, all of that is a light momentary affliction. Can I tell you that whatever this is for you, the thing that you haven't seen yet, in the eyes of the kingdom, in the eyes of eternity, it is a light and momentary affliction. As hard as it may be, it is preparing you for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Why? Because we look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. And 2 Corinthians 5 says we walk by faith, not by sight. If I only follow God as far as I can see, I'm missing out on the blessedness of the person who believes without seeing. Number three, doubt is normal, but what you do with it matters. Notice Jesus doesn't shame Thomas in this story. I've learned to start reading the red letters with a smile. Imagine a smiling Jesus reading the red letters when you open the Gospels, and it changes how you read the tone. For whatever reason, I tend to think that God's, you know, expecting more from me. Maybe it's some childhood problem, I don't know. My parents are not in the service, I don't think, so let's keep that between you and I. They moved here now, so i got to be more careful. But you can read Jesus as this stern or like, holy, he talks like this, you know? Anyone who is Catholic around here? But if you read his words with a smile and assume he's smiling at Thomas, it changes the tone of it, right? He's like, Thomas, come here, put your finger here. See my hands, put out your hand and place it by my side. Don't disbelieve, but believe. Imagine he's excited and happy talking to Thomas. It changes the tone, right? Thomas says, my Lord and my God. And he says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet still believed. Doubt is normal. Jesus isn't shaming Thomas. He's actually calling him up to blessedness. He's saying, in this moment, I'll give you what you're asking for. But you want to be happy, Christian? You want to be happy, believer? You want to be able to have joy and chaos? You want, to, you want to believe beyond your understanding? Then choose to believe without having to see it, and you're going to be happier. Some of you are not happy. What do you do with your doubt? Jesus answers his question, but challenges him to say you can live your life with not, without having to know it all. God wants the pursuit, and what I don't know about him awakens a hunger in me. And when I know it all, I don't pursue it anymore. Why did God make your spouse confusing? So that you'd continue to pursue them. G. Campbell Morgan said it like this. The difference between doubt and unbelief. If you believe in God you sometimes wonder why he allows certain things to happen. But keep in mind, there's a difference between doubt and unbelief. Unbelief is an act of the will, while doubt is born out of a troubled mind and a broken heart. Your doubt unchecked and internalized will slowly turn into unbelief. And you'll be an unbelieving believer. And where you are today is where you'll be 20, 30 years from now. The progression in your life will stop because the doubt turned to unbelief and you built a monument around what God hasn't done yet. And that's actually the basis of your interaction with God. Instead of enjoying the provision, enjoying what he's done, the only thing you think about is where's the straw. Number four, belief turns your if God into a when God. And there's a big difference. An unbelieving believer says, if God does this, if God heals me, if God comes through, if God provides, if God answers the deep need of my, if God heals my broken heart, the believing believer says, when God, when God heals me, 
when God provides, when God fulfills his promise, when God does that. It has an expectation that says, I don't see it yet, but I'm walking in the blessedness of knowing that what he has handed me has everything that I need for my current today and my future, and I can take steps because when God, and it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Doubt will say when and I don't know how, and that's okay. Unbelief starts to question if God is really who he says he is. One's expecting the wheels to fall off at any moment and we live our lives in fear. The other is expecting God to be good in surprising ways and lives in an anticipation of what God's still yet to do in my life. 1 Peter 1, 6, Peter says it like this, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Can I tell you, the trial that you're in now, and it might be a lifelong battle with disease that isn't going to get healed until you cross over into eternity. But when you look back at the grand scheme of your eternal life, and you're sitting in heaven looking back at the disease you battled for that little while on earth, you will look back and say, it was a little while, if necessary, I was grieved by a various trial. Sometimes this becomes a monster in your mind, and this is your entire identity. This is me, this is my struggle, this is who I am. Peter's saying, no matter how big that thing is, it is a little while. It is a short thing. If necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. So the tested genuineness of your faith, your faith, more precious than gold. That means your faith is more important than your 401k. Your faith is more important than your bank account balance. Your faith is more important than how si- the size of your house. Your faith is more precious than the school your kids go to. More precious than gold and perishes, although it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When Jesus comes again, everything, every straw that you've yet to see come true in your life is going to look really, really small. Verse 8, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him, and you rejoice in joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. When your if God turns into a when God, everything changes because you're choosing the blessedness of the person who can believe without seeing it. You can pass the burden of having to understand it from your shoulders to God's. There's a, there's a lightness that comes that when it says, I don't know, and I don't need to. He's God, and I'm not. And I can walk by faith even though it doesn't make sense right now. The straw's in the bag. I can't see it, but I believe it. It turns you into a Joshua and Caleb that goes in and looks at, at as, as difficult as the promise of God looks. It looks into your promised land, and when everyone else sees giants, you see an opportunity for God to do something even more powerful than you ever imagined. Your entire perspective changes and says, oh, look what God is going to do. That is a blessed state of mind. The unblessed, unbelieving believer says, If God does that, that would be crazy. But I'm going to start making decisions around my life like he's not going to do it. You miss your moment. Point number five, God's God's word framed the world, but does it frame yours? Hebrews 11.1 says this, Faith is a substance of things that you hope for, the evidence of what you can't see. I can't see it. Faith begins when I can't see it. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Genesis 1, it says he spoke things into existence. He didn't like like hand make stars. He said stars. Crazy, right? Dolphins. There wasn't like a dolphin cabinet that he pulled the materials together and made it. He spoke them. He spoke the world into existence. It framed the world so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which are visible. Sometimes the hand of God is seen best by those who stand on the word of God. 
I don't need to see it to believe it. I understand this word has gotten into me enough where I've gotten into my word, it's gotten into me, and now this actually shapes the world that I live in. Who God is, he is who he says he is. He will do what he said he will do, and I don't need to see it today to make decisions around my life that align with this word of God. I'm taking steps towards the unseen, like Abraham walking, like Noah building an ark before it's raining. I'm taking steps as a person who believes without seeing it yet that my God is faithful and he is good and I will smile through the storm because of the blessedness to the point that other people are looking at me saying, man, I wish I had what he had. The enviable state. Three questions. One, are you happy? For real, are you happy? Being real, I've struggled this last couple months. I don't like January and February. Not my jam. Are you happy? What would your spouse say? Would your spouse say, yeah, they're really happy. They're happy people. They're great to be around. They're enjoyable to be around. Or would your spouse say, they're kind of grumpy? Men? Sometimes I speak to men because I am one, and I've learned a long time ago, it's not wise for any man to be an expert on women. There's a fork in the road that you take when you get older as a man, you're, you're either a, a happy sage or you're a grumpy old man. And I said that, you all thought about several men you know that are grumpy old men. Don't look around. The sage is joyful. He often took steps of faith and saw the goodness of God along the journey as he chose to believe what he couldn't see. The grumpy old man often stopped taking steps years ago because he needed to see it to believe it. And God didn't lower himself to the level of your understanding. And there's a whole big box of things that both of those men don't understand. There's unmet expectations. There's broken things. There's things, there's family situations that never have resolved yet. There's financial things that didn't go right. There's things in that box that they both carry. The sage has happily said, I don't understand all that, but I'm still believing God. I don't need to. The grumpy old man has that box and he takes it everywhere he goes and he's still talking about how, you know, his boss messed him over in 2009. Well, this happened and that happened. They built monuments around things that God didn't do and they're grumpy. Men, there's a blessing in not having to understand God to still believe him. Are you walking around frustrated at things that he hasn't done yet? Are you agitated? He would tell you today, like he's told me as I was prepping for this message, I got real convicted about how unhappy I've been. I have not been blessed because God's got some straws in the back that I haven't seen yet that I've been demanding to see before I'll gladly say thank you, God, for what you've given me. Number two, are you anxious? Anxiety feeds on uncertainty. Every little uncertainty in your mind of how things that you don't know, that's where anxiety wakes up in the morning and starts to eat. But what if this happens? What if that happens? It's probably not gonna go your way. The wheels are about to fall off. Yeah, it's not good. Your boss schedules a meeting with you and it's like, you're probably getting fired. You ideate the worst case scenarios. That's what anxiety does. It takes the unknown and the unseen and starts to whisper lies in your heart and spirit about it. And you take the unseen things and you start to try to rationalize through all of them in your flesh. God is saying, give me your unseens. Give me your unseens. Because what I'm handing you, it's in the bag. The anxious person owns their unseens and refuses to believe God in the process. But God wants to meet you in that place of uncertainty. And if you don't invite him in, you'll be the God over that air of your life. And you're going to miss the blessing of peace and joy in the conflict. It's in the bag. Last question, number three, are you praying? And we'll close here. You can stand with me. And I'm going to ask the uh, ministry team to come forward. I know we already did a time of ministry, but I'd just like to give people a chance to respond if you need to. Are you praying? Ravi Zacharias said this, I have absolutely no doubt that if you are a praying Christian, your faith in God is what is carrying you through both the good times and the hard times. However, if you are not a praying person, you are carrying your faith. 
You are trying to make your faith work from you apart from your source of power and trying to carry the infinite is very exhausting. Are you praying? Through the unknowns, through the unseen? Sometimes the unknown and the unseen thing in your life, the straw is actually designed to bring you back to the place of prayer where you can wrestle with God over this thing. But when I don't pray, I actually begin to carry my faith and the weight of the infinite will crush me. Are you transferring the weight of your doubts to him? Do you come out of prayer feeling lighter or did you just complain to your ceiling fan for an hour? You're actually saying, God, I'm actively saying, I don't see this, but I'm trusting that as you give me the bag, I know everything that you've given is in this. And you transfer the weight. Your prayer life becomes a processing ground for your doubt. So the word today is this, what's the unseen in your life? I just wanna encourage you today, it's in the bag. God might answer your prayer, but he's telling you there's a blessing that's reserved for those who will believe without having to see it. I'll pray here in a moment, and if you're in a space where you're like, um, that just hit me like a ton of bricks and I need to pray with someone, come down, get prayer. Um, that's not everyone, but if it's you, and you're like, I need to make some changes. I'm not happy, I'm anxious, and I'm not praying about it, and I'm not walking in the blessedness of that Jesus said. I'm more of a Thomas. I'm a doubting Thomas, not a happy Thomas. God can change that for you today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. God, I thank you that uh, it's real, it's powerful, it cuts. God, I thank you this book is a mirror. And you said we can look at it and we can see who we are and we can change and your spirit will come alive inside of us, give us the power to change, God. It's not by trying harder or working more. God, it's about just choosing to believe, God, in the thing that we can't see. God, to find the blessedness of joy and chaos, of peace in the storm, of knowing that, that you, are, you are still on the throne. You have not forgotten us. The straw is in the bag and you've handed it to us. God, I pray that as we go out this week, God, we would have moments where we would just say, when the unknowns and the uncertains start to creep up in our mind, God, I pray that we would invite you into that space to say, God, you're good, you're faithful, you've got it taken care of, and I'm gonna choose joy and choose happiness in the unknown as I walk this out with you, knowing that you are making a way in each and every one of our lives. God, I thank you that your presence is real and powerful and true. God, I pray for this, this church, God, as we go forward into our schools, into our jobs, into our homes, God, that we would be a, a, a people that are blessed. God, that we would be a kingdom blessed, that the world would look around and say, I want what they have. I want to be happy like that. Lord, help us be that, God, as we choose to give you, God, control back. God, we, we give you control. We believe what we can't see this morning. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. God bless you. Have a great week. If you need prayer, please come forward and get it.